Now that the vSphere client's installed, I'm going to go ahead and use it to connect to my ESXi host. So I'm just going to open it. I've previously connected to this host, so the IP address is already listed. Otherwise, I would just provide the IP address or the host name if I've registered this host in DNS already, and then log in as root with whatever password was set during the installation. If I was logged into the domain, either if my host was integrated with Active Directory, or typically if I'm logging into vCenter, vCenter will be part of the domain, I could just say to use my Windows session credentials. But in this case, I'm logging in with local credentials on the ESXi host. Click Login. So I'm still running in evaluation mode, so I get an evaluation notice. I'm just going to go ahead and say OK. But you'll notice there is an option to assign a license to the host from here. But we can also do that in the configuration. So now that I'm connected, I've previously used this. So typically what would happen is we would start on the home page. So here you'll see we have the inventory listed where I can access the host as well as its virtual machines. And we also see an option for roles where we can configure various sets of permissions and an option to review the logs for that system. So we'll come back and take a look at the logs a little later. And you'll notice we have a bit of a breadcrumb trail. We get a menu back where we can access the sub items of the earlier ones. So you'll see that here, we have the inventory of home, which shows us the inventory of the VMware objects. Then you'll see that we have the administration as part of that, and we have roles and system logs. So if I go back to my inventory, you'll see that the host that I connected to, and I used the IP address when I connected, is listed here. Now the getting started page doesn't really offer a lot. You'll see there's a link there that says create a new virtual machine, but you know what, we can also do that very easily just by right clicking on our host and choosing to create a new virtual machine. This page doesn't do a lot for us. And a lot of times when we click onto a host or click onto a virtual machine itself, we're going to want to get to something more interesting quickly. So we're just gonna say close tab here. And if I click on the little link, then it's not gonna come back. You can get it back if you need to. You can just go into edit client settings and there is an option here to show the getting started tabs. You'll see there's a few other options in here for larger environments. You can change timeout settings if you're on a high latency link, you're managing servers across continents or something like that. You can change timeout values here. You can also go in and see some of the size and other details that'll be used for displaying large sets of lists. So now that we've closed that initial welcome page, we've got the summary page. You'll see here it's telling me that I've got ESXi shell enabled. That's always going to bring up a warning when we turn it on. VMware recommends we turn it off will also tell us if SSH is enabled on that host too, which would imply remote access to the shell, which might even be more of a security risk. Now, in this case, I'm running ESXi inside a virtual machine running inside VMware Workstation. All my manufacturer and model details here list VMware, although, of course, this is typically going to be our physical hosts that we're running it on. And we'll see details about the number of cores that are available, what type of CPUs we have, the license that's present. And we can also see details of sockets and cores and how many logical processors we have if we're using hyperthreading and whether hyperthreading is active and the number of network cards in the system, whether we're connected, how many VMs we have. Participating with enhanced vMotion compatibility inside a DRS cluster or if we're enabled for vMotion on that host. Resource usage and what data stores are available to us and the network objects that we've created for port groups. And we're going to come back to all this in later videos. A little bit more detail down here for fault tolerance details and how to add vCenter, which we're going to see in later videos. Way down at the bottom, we've got some links to create virtual machines, resource pools, do maintenance mode, and either reboot or shut down this host. We can do a lot of that, though, in other places, either by right-clicking on to the host itself or in some other area of the interface. I have created a virtual machine. I've gone ahead and removed it from the inventory. So it's on my data store, but I don't have it visible here in my client. So I'm going to add that at the end of this video. So if I click on the virtual machines tab, we don't really see anything, but typically we would get some details of resource utilization. We also have the resource allocation tab and the performance tab. We're going to come back to this in later videos and we'll do a whole series of videos on performance of VMware. And if we go over to the configuration tab, this is really where most everything that we need to do in order to get ESXi configured the way we need it to, to participate with whatever storage it's going to use and configure whatever types of networking topology we need. A lot of the other system specific configuration for DNS and for default gateways and so on is all here as well. So if we look over hardware configuration, you'll see under health status that we can view various components of the system 
depending on what's reported to VMware by the system anyway, depending on what the BIOS represents to VMware. We can see actually quite a lot of detail here in terms of fan modules and if they're failing or if there's problems with their rotation speeds and things like that. And we can get whatever warnings bubble up from the system. When you're running this on a physical machine, you're going to have a lot more functionality available than we get here. Click over to processors. We'll see the same kind of details that we had on the summary page for the processors. And there's the properties link that's grayed out here. If you have a system that's hyper-threading capable, you can go in there to configure whether or not VMware should use it. If you have hyper-threading capable hardware, definitely make sure that it's turned on in your system BIOS and make sure that it's turned on here as well. And a little bit more detail of the system. You can see things like asset and service tag details or whatever, again, that your hardware provides and represents to VMware. If we go under memory, there's not really anything that you can see or do here, but we do see a little bit of detail on how much memory we're using for the system. And you can see it's actually very little and how much memory is left available for the virtual machines themselves. And we'll take much more of a look in the performance videos at how memory management works because there's some fascinating things that VM kernel is able to do. If we click over to the storage link, we can see the data stores that we have available. So when we did our installation on local disks, whatever disk space wasn't used for the system was automatically formatted as a VMFS file system. Once we start presenting volumes from the SAN, or once we start presenting LUNs from the SAN, whether they have a volume on them or not, we're either going to need to discover those LUNs and discover the VMFS volumes on them, or we're going to need to discover the LUNs and then place VMFS volumes on them. So we'll take a look at all of that in the storage videos, but this is where we would do it. And we can see the VMFS volumes that we've created and also the devices that are actually present either in the system or that are being presented over iSCSI or Fiber Channel. And we can see the transport options here for that. If we go over to the networking link, you can see the details for the virtual switches and port groups and VM kernel ports that have been created. So whatever NICs we use during the installation are going to be listed here. And you can see that we've got a vSwitch called vSwitch0, a virtual machine port group, which is what we're going to connect our virtual machines to, called VM Network, which has various options associated with it we'll look at in another video. And the VM kernel port, which actually represents the VM kernel logical IP address that we're going to use to connect to it. Now we can use VM kernel IP addresses effectively or VM kernel ports with IP addresses assigned to them for quite a few purposes in VMware, either for connecting to them for management purposes, for vMotion, for iSCSI, for fault tolerance and other features. We may need to create quite a few additional VM kernel ports for different IP-based functionality of the host itself. The virtual machines will be bridged onto the network. There's no network address translation or anything like that in VMware. Those virtual machines will have to have their own IP addresses configured as appropriate. We're just going to attach virtual machines to this port group, and they're going to get automatically pushed out onto these NICs. Now, whether two NICs is enough to handle the load for all those virtual machines is certainly a question, and we'll talk about that more in the networking videos. Click the storage adapters link. We can see the very few storage adapters that I actually have, but if you had a variety of local SCSI adapters, fiber channel host bus adapters, you'd see them listed here. We click over to network adapters, the same thing, but for our network interfaces, and we can see that there's certain details present, like the MAC address of the interface and what vSwitch it's currently associated with. Also the observed IP ranges that can help us identify what the NICs are actually attached to.